now I'm happy to introduce you to our presenter, Katherine Zarnowski, Certified Genetic Counselor. She is a licensed certified genetic counselor at MD Anderson Cancer Center at Cooper. She graduated from the University of Maryland School of Medicine with a master's in genetic counseling in 2012. She has been with Cooper for almost three years and has been practicing as a clinical cancer counselor for more than 10 years. Now, without further delay, welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Roxanne, for that uh, unnecessary introduction. <laughs> uh, but I am Katie Zarnowski. As Roxanne said, I am a genetic counselor uh, here at Cooper but I've been working as a genetic counselor in um, the cancer setting for over 10 years now. So happy to be speaking with you this afternoon. I really have nothing to disclose other than I am a Cooper employee. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the role of genetics and genomics. And as Roxanne said, I'm happy to answer um, any questions at the end as time allows. So just to give you an overview, I'm going to go through an introduction to cancer genetics, compare and contrast germline versus somatic genetic testing, review the process of risk assessment for hereditary cancer syndromes, including potential indications for referral or testing, and discussion of possible results and implications. I'll describe the evolution of hereditary cancer genetic testing, as well as touch on current testing practices. I'll provide syndrome examples to illustrate testing considerations. I'll highlight some recent hot topics, and I'll provide answers to commonly asked questions regarding genetic counseling uh, and or genetic testing. So what is cancer? Why does it happen? Is it genetic? Is it hereditary? So cancer is a genetic disease. Uh, we know that normally human cells grow and divide to form new cells as our bodies need them. Old or damaged cells die off and new cells take their place. Cancer happens when there are changes or mutations in genes that control the way normal cells work, grow, and divide. So cells may become abnormal and begin to divide without stopping. And this can form tumors, it can invade normal tissue, and it may spread to other areas of the body. But most cancers are not hereditary. Um, and that's a very kind of confusing concept for a lot of people. Um, most cancers, 90%, are sporadic familial due to somatic mutations, which I'll explain further in a minute, um, happening related to chance, exposures, other risk factors. But it's a very small piece of the puzzle, only about 10% there, that are related to mutations that are germline. And that's when we can really call a cancer hereditary. So somatic versus germline. Somatic we know that every cancer, as I said, has somatic mutations, which are changes in the gene that happened in the tumor, and they're confined to the tumor. They're not expected to be in any other cells of the body. And this is what happens in most sporadic cancers that happen by chance. A germline mutation is a change in a gene that was inherited, meaning someone was born with that mutation and therefore causes an increased risk for someone to develop cancer over the course of their lifetime. And that's when we're able to refer to the cancer as a hereditary cancer, which as I said uh, previously, is only about 10% of all cancers. So how does a germline genetic mutation increase cancer risk? And I think it's always helpful to look at this and really compare the process between a sporadic cancer developing versus a hereditary cancer developing. So we all start out life with, let's say, two working copies of the BRCA1 gene. As we go through life, we all acquire changes to our genes. 
uh, things like smoking, diet, lack of exercise. Honestly, who knows? I'm sure we'll learn about something else we're all doing that's not great for us. But we acquire a change to one copy. But we still have that backup working copy that can protect us and, and help to prevent cancer from developing. Not until we go through life a little bit longer, also acquire a change to that second copy that we then have no protection and a tumor or cancer can develop. In a hereditary cancer, we start out life with one mutation in one copy of the gene. So we only have that backup working copy. And as we go through life and acquire a change, there's then no protection and the tumor can develop. And because the first process takes longer. We tend to see sporadic types of cancer being diagnosed later in life. So we're talking 60s, 70s, whereas the hereditary process is faster. So we tend to see hereditary cancers being diagnosed when someone's younger in their 40s, for example. Types of genetic testing, just to further compare somatic versus germline. Um, so what we do, what I do uh, here at Cooper is coordinate germline testing, um, which as you can see is typically coordinated by a genetic counselor. It detects inherited genetic mutations. So those mutations that we were born with that are in every cell of our body. This information is helpful for cancer risk management and informative for other family members. And this type of testing may not accurately reflect somatic changes. Somatic or tumor testing is what is typically coordinated by a treating physician. Uh, typically it's a medical oncologist who is ordering that type of testing. It detects genetic mutations that are confined to the tumor cells. This type of information is helpful for individualized cancer treatment, but it's less helpful for other people in the family, and it may not accurately reflect germline changes. So a conversation we're often having with patients who have had somatic testing is that we may not find the same mutation when we do germline genetic testing, uh, because those somatic findings are, could just be confined to the tumor and maybe not in every cell of their body. So hereditary cancer syndromes, why are they important? What are they? And who should consider being tested for them? So why are they important? Um, what I always tell people who know what I do for a living and they ask about it and they say, oh, isn't that a hard job or isn't that a depressing job? And I always say, yes and no. Um, you know, it's definitely a setting where knowledge is power. And if we identify that someone's at risk for something, we can do something about it. So you may or may not be familiar with the fact that Angelina Jolie has had genetic testing. She does have a BRCA mutation, and she was pretty public with her decision to undergo some preventative surgeries based on that finding. Um, and I think this is a really nice uh, quote from her that was in the New York Times around the time when she was first tested. So she says, I chose not to keep my story private because there are many women who do not know that they might be living under the shadow of cancer. It is my hope that they too will be able to get gene tested and that if they have a high risk, they too will know that they have strong options. Life comes with many challenges. The ones that should not scare us are the ones we can take on and take control of. And something I always highlight to my patients is that there's really no such thing as bad news when we do this type of testing, because finding a mutation is really good information to have. Because if we don't know about something, we can't do anything about it. But if we have the knowledge of the risk, we can then be proactive. And our ultimate goal is always to prevent someone from getting cancer, but we can also screen someone closely um, in hopes to prevent a future cancer or at least diagnose another cancer at its earliest stage when it's uh, most easily treated. So hereditary cancer syndromes um, happen when there is a germline genetic mutation that causes an increased risk for cancer in a person or a family. And the vast majority of hereditary cancer syndromes, not all, 
but the vast majority are dominant in inheritance, which means there is a 50% chance of a parent passing on the mutation to their child. And that is regardless of gender. So we hear a lot of, uh, you know, women, when we're talking about breast cancer, for example, say, I'm doing this for my daughters. And I always say, and your sons, uh, because this can get passed on to either gender. And there certainly can be cancer risks associated with these mutations for both genders. There are variable lifetime risks for cancer. Um, so some genes we would put in a high risk category, some in a more moderate risk category, and then some we really just consider increased risk today because we just don't have enough data to really um, quantify the risk. And the risks for cancer based on a certain mutation can certainly be gender dependent. So just some examples, I'm not going to go through these in detail in the interest of time. Definitely the most well-known hereditary breast and ovarian cancer or HBOC, which is associated with changes in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, most common associated cancers are breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreatic. Lynch syndrome is another well-known syndrome associated with changes in five different genes. And the main cancers we see there are colon, uterine, stomach, ovarian. Um, also on this list is hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, um, in which we see diffuse stomach or gastric cancer and a lobular type of breast cancer. Cowden syndrome associated with changes in the P10 gene, where we are primarily seeing breast, non-medullary thyroid cancer, and uterine cancer. Familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, and mute YH-associated polyposis, or MAP, um, we tend to see people with polyposis, which is having lots and lots of colon polyps, as well as a risk for colon cancer. And then we from Maney syndrome, um, which is associated with changes in the TP53 gene, we can see breast, brain, bone, adrenal gland, leukemia, and what's typical of Lefromani actually is a very early age of onset, um, actually in childhood typically. So when should we consider uh, cancer genetics evaluation? And this list is not all inclusive, um, it's pretty inclusive, but main um, reason to consider multiple primary cancers. So not someone with um, breast cancer that spread to the lung. We would call that a, a metastatic cancer, but someone who had breast cancer in their 40s and then 10 years later went on to develop ovarian cancer, for example. When we're seeing breast cancer diagnosed at early ages, which is typically at age 50 or under, triple negative breast cancer, so breast cancers that are not fed by hormones like estrogen and progesterone. When we see males with breast cancer, anyone with ovarian cancer. Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry um, with breast cancer or high-grade prostate cancer. And the reason for that is that there are some founder mutations specific to that population. Um, so anyone can have a BRCA mutation, for example, but we know that the risk is higher or there's a higher frequency of mutations in people who have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And we're talking about a large percent of ancestry. So I know, as I'll get to later, a lot of people have done ancestry testing, and they're finding out they're two or three percent uh, Jewish. Um, but that is not something that would uh, put up a red flag. Uterine or colon cancer diagnosed under the age of fifty. Colon polyposis, as I said on the previous slide, lots and lots of colon polyps. Uh, typically, when someone has had more than ten polyps. Anyone with pancreatic cancer, anyone with metastatic prostate cancer, when there's a combination of a personal and family history of the same or related cancers, strong family history alone, so you don't have to have a cancer diagnosis to have genetic testing, known familial mutations, so if someone in the family has previously been tested and a mutation has already been identified, and then select somatic or tumor genetic testing results. 
So there are some findings in an individual's tumor when they have somatic or tumor testing um, that we know can be germline findings. So we, we typically do do germline testing to try to decipher that. So gathering the family history. So what are some of the important questions to ask or, or gather if you're considering this? Which blood relatives have or had cancer? Where in the body did the cancer start? So what is the primary site? You know, we'll hear a lot of people say, oh, she died from lung cancer or liver cancer or brain cancer. And I always say, well, did it start there or did it spread there from another part of the body? At what age were the relatives first diagnosed? Were there any known contributing risk factors? Um, so, you know, environmental exposures in the workplace or some people who um, spent some time in the military or people who were smokers, things like that. Has anyone had genetic testing? Uh, if so, what was the result? Which genes were included in that testing? And can you get a copy of that report? And then important to gather both the maternal, so mom side of the family, and paternal, dad side of the family. So germline genetic testing. So a little bit about assessment and testing process, evolution of genetic testing, which genes are tested, what are the possible results, and how are these results used? So key components of genetic assessment and testing. So the first thing we typically do when we um, meet with an individual is we go through uh, personal medical history as well as their family history. We then uh, assess that, see if they're eligible for genetic testing, and then provide some education regarding hereditary cancer. We then obtain informed consent for the testing by discussing clinical and familial implications of testing as well as possible results. We would then collect a sample, um, typically blood or saliva if proceeding with testing and send that off to the genetic testing lab. And then once the results are received, uh, we review them, uh, make any medical management recommendations for both the patient and their family, um, in combination with one of our providers, so typically either a nurse practitioner or a physician, um, and we make those recommendations for the patient and their family based on the result. So evolution of genetic testing, kind of how have things changed? So when we first started doing genetic testing, um, we really did syndrome or gene-specific testing. So things like BRCA1 and 2 testing or testing for Lynch syndrome or mutations in the CDH1 gene, we kind of looked at the family history to say, what is the most likely scenario? Um, and we sent testing specific to that. We now tend to do multi-gene testing or panel testing, uh, where a variable number of genes are tested. There are some pan-cancer panels um, versus targeted cancer panels. So there's the option to do a test on looking at all of the breast cancer susceptibility genes versus a test looking at common genes associated with multiple types of cancer, including breast, gynecological, GI, et cetera. And the panel is based typically on level of known cancer risk, um, or established medical management guidelines, including those high, moderate, or increased risk genes. Um, and it often is uh, you know, patient influenced by how much or how little information is someone looking for uh, by doing this type of testing. Targeted genetic testing is still in practice. So single site testing is when there has been testing performed in the family previously and there is a known identified mutation. We can then test specifically for that mutation. And then we can also do site-specific testing um, when a mutation has been identified in someone's tumor sample, and we're looking to see if that's germline or in the other cells. And then based on ancestry, so I talked a little bit about uh, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and how there are founder mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 genes. So we could test someone just for the founder mutations or the three mutations that are common in those genes to people who have that ancestry. 
Multi-gene panels are available for many different cancer types. Um, this list is not all inclusive, but you'll see kind of the common breast, ovary, uterine, colon, prostate, pancreatic, uh, some of the more rare indications like um, paragangliomas or pheochromocytomas are also on there. Many of the labs do have uh, panels specific to these, these more rare cancer types. Possible results of genetic testing. So there's actually three possible results whenever we do genetic testing, which can be a little bit confusing to people. Um, certainly people are typically doing this type of testing for a, a yes or no answer. So a positive result is when we find a mutation. You will hear people say um, that means there's a pathogenic variant or a deleterious variant, sometimes even likely pathogenic or likely deleterious, which means there is a finding that is a harmful finding that is known to increase someone's risk of developing cancer. A negative result would mean no mutations were found. And then a variant of uncertain or unknown significance is kind of the genetic fancy way of saying an inconclusive finding which can happen because of normal genetic variation. We know that uh, no one's genes all read exactly the same unless they're identical twins. So it's common to have some variation even in our cancer susceptibility genes. And typically the lab can look at a finding and say whether or not it's a problem, um, and therefore they'd put it in the positive category or whether it's nothing to worry about and it is just normal variation, in which case they would call it negative. But sometimes they say, you know, we just don't have enough information about this right now, and they will put it in this uncertain category. Clinically, we tend to treat findings in the uncertain category as negative, because 90% of the time when we learn more about uncertain findings, they are being downgraded to negative results. So I like this um, just to kind of show the classification. So on the left side of the arrow, all of the kind of green findings would be a negative result or those uncertain findings that are either completely uncertain or even leaning more towards negative with that likely benign classification. And if we find that in someone, medical management is really based on their personal and family history. Um, and these uncertain results, as I said, are not going to influence recommendations for care. But on the right side, in the red, if we find a variant that's leaning towards a positive result, so that classification would be likely pathogenic or a true positive or pathogenic finding, then medical management is based on cancer risks that are linked with that um, particular gene where the mutations were found. So a little bit about implications of a germline uh, genetic test result. So for a positive result, we know that someone's cancer risks are going to be increased due to a germline mutation. Someone's cancer treatment may be impacted. So maybe we are discussing a larger surgery. Uh, maybe there are specific chemotherapy or immunotherapy or clinical trials. Cancer risk management uh, will be based on cancer risks associated with the gene and other risk factors. And then in terms of information for the family, we know at-risk relatives can then be tested for the known mutation. A negative or a, an uncertain result, cancer risk, it may still be increased due to risk factors uh, in their personal and family history. Cancer treatment will not be impacted. Cancer risk management will be based on other risk factors like in the personal or family history, but nothing specific to any, any genes. And then for the family, uh, less likely to be hereditary in the family, but others, especially those who have also been affected with cancer, could still be tested. So a syndrome example, um, and, and really the example that I put in here is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, or HBOC which is associated with changes in uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2, commonly referred to as the BRCA genes or the BRCA genes. Um, all the way on the left, I went through the different cancer sites um, that can be associated. So breast cancer, 
a second primary breast cancer, so not a recurrence, ovarian cancer, male breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and melanoma. And then this first column is the risks that are associated with general population. Um, so everyone, even without a mutation in the BRCA genes, has a risk for these cancers. Um, and then in comparison to the risks we see for a BRCA1 carrier and a BRCA2 carrier. And obviously the most significant risks are um, for, for breast cancer for both of the genes, as well as ovarian cancer. And then the other risks are all significantly less. However, they are significantly greater than general population risk. So management options. Um, so there's kind of two categories and one would be increased surveillance and the other would be focused on prevention. So increased surveillance, Typically, we start screening earlier for someone who has a BRCA mutation, like breast screening starting at the age of 25, as opposed to age 40, when the general population starts. There can be a greater frequency for screening. So oftentimes, we stagger imaging in our mutation positives so that they're having um, screening in one way or another every six months. And then additional screening. So we tend to do breast MRIs in addition to someone's mammogram. And then prevention, there are medications typically referred to as chemo prevention that people can take, which have been proven to reduce someone's lifetime risk of developing cancer. And then there's also going to be the option for prophylactic or preventative surgeries. So RRM stands for, oops, sorry, a risk-reducing mastectomy where BSO stands for uh, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. So when someone chooses to have either their breast or ovaries removed in the preventative setting. And then this next slide I put in here really to show um, kind of why we're moving away from doing single gene or syndrome testing, because this is a list of everything we would kind of consider to be a breast cancer susceptibility gene today. So all the way on the left, you'll see those high-risk genes. So genes that are associated with a significant increased risk for breast cancer. And then in the middle, the moderate risk genes. So those that are associated with an increased risk for breast cancer above the general population, but maybe not as high as some of those higher risk genes. And then the last category are those potential increased risk genes that you know maybe the risk is still being determined um, but they are on some of the breast cancer panels. The guidelines are kind of mentioned them to say, you know, keep your eye on these. And we have a discussion amongst our team about breast cancer management when someone has a finding. So typically when we you know, sit down with someone today, let's say with a personal or family history of breast cancer, instead of talking to them specifically about BRCA testing, we tend to offer them uh, panels of breast cancer genes that look something uh, similar to this. So some hot topics. I'm going to talk a little bit about direct-to-consumer genetic testing, um, as well as genetic testing scams. So some of these uh, pictures might look familiar to you. I know we're meeting with a lot of people these days who talk about how they have done testing through 23andMe or Ancestry uh, testing. So no physician order is necessary for this type of testing. Consumers can opt in to receive um, certain medical information through the testing. So an example that I like to give is that 23andMe does do testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2. So we have met with people who say, oh, I already had that testing through 23andMe. But what most people don't realize is that through 23andMe, the BRCA testing is actually only specific to those three uh, founder mutations common in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So it's great if someone has tested negative for those findings, but that's not really telling us a whole lot for someone, especially those that don't have known Jewish ancestry. So there's a little bit of concern about patient interpretation of positive or negative results. Um, and a, an FDA press release that came out in 2018, a uh, quote from there says, 
Consumers and healthcare professionals should not use the test results to determine any treatments, including anti-hormone therapies and prophylactic removal of the breast or ovaries. Such decisions require confirmatory testing and genetic counseling. The test also does not provide information on a person's overall risk of developing any type of cancer. The use of the test carries significant risks if individuals use the test results without consulting a physician or genetic counselor. So other factors to consider regarding direct-to-consumer testing, um, I, I kind of made a table of some of the, the benefits versus the risks and limitations. So definitely benefits, um, this is promoting awareness of genetic disease. It can provide per personalized information about health, disease risk, as well as other traits. It may help someone be more proactive about their health. It does not require approval from a healthcare provider or a health insurance company. Results are not often in your insurance or medical record. It is often less expensive than clinical genetic testing. The DNA sample collection is usually simple and non-invasive and results are available quickly. And then anonymous data is added to a large database that can be used to further medical research. Some of the risks and limitations. So tests may not be available for um, health conditions or traits of interest to someone in particular. These results cannot definitively tell you whether you will or will not get a disease. Um, they often need to be confirmed with a clinical genetic test. Often these tests are only testing for a subset of variants and maybe not sequencing or reading through a gene in its entirety. Unexpected information that you receive about your health, family relationships, or ancestry may be stressful or upsetting. Um, to be honest, in the past couple of years, it's um, very interesting to me how many people I have heard of doing ancestry testing or something similar to that and saying, actually, I learned that I have a half brother that I never knew about. Um, so things that I think we don't really think about when we proceed with this type of testing, um, just some of the things that can uncover. And then often lack genetic counseling or thorough informed consent. People may make important decisions based on inaccurate, incomplete, or misunderstood information. There is little oversight or regulation of a lot of these testing companies. Genetic privacy may be compromised, uh, so the results may impact your ability to obtain life, disability, or long-term care insurance. And then there are some um, genetic testing scams out there that are targeting primarily Medicare patients. So just kind of my, my PSA here, beware. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Service Office um, of Inspector General has alerted the public about a fraud scheme involving genetic testing. And genetic testing fraud is occurring when Medicare is billed for a test or a screen that was not medically necessary or was not ordered by a Medicare's uh, beneficiary's treating physician. So scammers are often offering Medicare uh, patients cheek swabs for genetic testing, really to obtain their Medicare information to then be used for fraudulent billing purposes or possibly uh, medical identity theft. These scams are being marketed in a variety of different ways. So I've heard patients say, cancer screening test, hereditary cancer test, DNA screening test, Parkinson's screening test, dementia screening test, um, cardiovascular genetic test, or a pharmacogenomics test. Um, and that is usually testing that people market to say, you know, if you're on medication for anxiety, depression, or hypertension, high cholesterol, you could have genetic testing to see if you're on the right medication or the right dose of medication. And these things are often being marketed at large community events um, or by telemarketers. So just receiving random phone calls saying, you know, you've been identified as someone that's eligible for free genetic testing. So protect yourself. Uh, if a genetic testing kit is mailed to you, don't accept it unless it was something ordered by your physician that you were expecting to receive in the mail. Um, they're saying don't even uh, accept the delivery, return it to the sender, and try to get a record of the sender's name and the date. 
Be suspicious of anyone who offers you free genetic testing and then requests your Medicare number. Um, if your personal information is compromised, it might be used in other future fraud schemes. Always read your Medicare summary notice or explanation of benefits. Um, if you're seeing the words gene analysis, molecular pathology, or laboratory, um, it may indicate some questionable genetic testing has occurred. So what to do um, if you think you've fallen victim to one of these schemes is report this. Um, you can call Medicare, you can contact the Office of Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or contact the local senior Medicare patrol for your particular area. And then some common questions um, regarding genetic testing. So like I said, I will do my best to answer any particular questions at the end, but I will say I kind of tried to put a list of some of the things that I answer most commonly on a day-to-day -day basis. So why is genetic testing important if I already have cancer? Um, so definitely for a survivor's audience, you know, we meet with a lot of people who say, I already had uh, breast cancer, I already had colon cancer, why does this really matter for me at this point? So there can be potential treatment implications for current or, or previous cancers. It can determine risk for future cancers. It can determine screening and management recommendations for future cancers. And then it can provide information for at-risk relatives. Oh no, not sure what's happening. Well, I don't know why that's happening. Um, so to learn more about whether or not you need genetic testing, gather information about your blood relatives, including cancer type, age at diagnosis, family uh, members' genetic testing results if known, discuss your questions and any personal family cancer history with your healthcare provider or a, a cancer genetics program genetic counselor. If you need additional genetic testing, so we have an automated version of some of these slides. I think that's what's happening. My apologies. Um, but to know whether or not you need additional genetic testing, um, really, I think some of the things we often point out to people, mm, it's hard to put a specific year or date. Um, because even once panel tests were available clinically, often patients weren't uh, proceeding with panels because of some of the concerns about uncertainty or coverage through insurance. Um, but clinically, we really were not offering panels prior to 2013. So that's kind of a, um, an estimate cutoff. Someone who has had BRCA1 and 2 testing only um, or site-specific analysis only. So if a mutation had previously been found in the family, you were just tested for that, but now some things have changed in terms of um, personal or family history and you're consider considering additional testing. So is the cost of genetic testing covered by insurance? Um, which is probably the number one question we get. And it is often covered in part or completely um, if relevant insurance medical necessity criteria are met. If you meet criteria for testing, I do always like to say that doesn't mean it would be 100% covered, um, but in most cases, we are able to get genetic testing covered or, or done for about $100 or less out of pocket today. Some labs do offer discounts on out-of-pocket expense based on someone's household size and annual income. There is the option to do benefits investigations um, ahead of testing or prior to testing available by most of the genetic testing laboratories. And then self-pay options are becoming more and more affordable. So, you know, even just probably five years ago to pay out of pocket for genetic testing would cost someone thousands of dollars. Um, and now these labs have really worked to make self-pay testing a, a reasonable consideration, and you can often do a self-pay testing for about $250 out of pocket today. Can the results of genetic testing be used against me? Um, so GINA, which stands for the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, is a federal law that protects people from genetic discrimination. 
So the misuse of genetic information, which has been effect in effect since 2008. GINA thankfully protects most health insurance companies and most employers from using genetic test results against someone in any kind of a negative or harmful way. Um, there are some exclusions for small employers or federal and uh, military personnel, uh, just to be aware of that. And then exclusions, so life insurance, long-term care insurance, or disability insurance are actually not protected by GINA. So something that we uh, talk to people about in pretest counseling is some of the implications of that. And oftentimes people will, if they don't have those policies, they'll look into getting them or think about getting them prior to having genetic testing done. And then how do I find a genetic counselor? Um, so there is the National Society of Genetic Counselors, which is our national um, society as genetic counselors, nsgc.org. They have a great feature uh, to find a genetic counselor. Um, most genetic counselors who are in practice are part of this database. And they now have the option to select whether you're looking for an in-person genetic counselor, um, someone like me who would see you in person at Cooper, or via telehealth, um, there are some remote genetic counseling options that are available, um, not only related to COVID and recently in recent years, um, but things that uh, have been in existence prior to then for people who live maybe in more um, rural areas. Um, and with that, I think we should have uh, about 15 minutes left for some questions. Um, and here I do have my direct contact information. So that is my direct email address. And then again, with that um, MDA genetics, um, main genetics program email address. <laughs> 